Gentlemen, a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. And that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and for the support of this declaration it's one of the great of ironies of american history the, protection the man who led politics. the revolution nearly lost his life fighting for that same british empire 20 years before and our sacred honor on the eve of battle george washington couldn't help but recollect that earlier war I did not let the anniversary of this month pass without a grateful remembrance of the escape we had at the meadows. And on the banks of the Monongahela. That was the war that made him the leader he was, the French and Indian War. But the day it all began, there was nothing heroic about the father of his country. To be fair, Washington is only 22. Ambitious and a little naive, he doesn't realize he's about to become a pawn in a chess game he doesn't understand. They are here. Washington's orders are to drive the French from this contested part of the frontier, with force if necessary. He doesn't know these French soldiers are on a diplomatic mission. doesn't take the time to find out what the French are after. Fire! It's George Washington's first taste of battle, and he likes it. I can, with truth, assure you that I heard the bullets whistle. There was something charming in the sound. The retreat cut off by Washington's Indian allies the French surrender within minutes. Their officer sits wounded. This is Ensign Joseph Coulon de Villiers de Jumonville. He's an envoy. Here's a letter from his commander. I do not speak French, do you? Under the protocol of the day, Washington is responsible for the well-being of the wounded Frenchman. But he soon realizes that this deep in the woods, different rules apply. Tu n'es pas encore mon, mon père. It turns out this Indian leader, known as the Half King, 
has his own agenda. Within minutes, the Half King's warriors plunder the French camp, scalping the dead and wounded before they leave. The massacre is not an outcome Washington expected, nor could he have foreseen the consequences. This incident will trigger an all-out war for North America that soon spreads around the world. We call it the French and Indian War. This is the story of a war that helped create a new nation no one could ever have predicted. This is the story of the war that made America. To understand how young George Washington could set such momentous events into motion, we have to go back in time before he blundered into battle and see how the stage had already been set for war. The full effects of the Half King's decision won't be felt for years to come. And one thing is certain, the French are not about to give up the forks without a fight. One look at the map shows why. The French already control Canada and the Great Lakes region. By building a string of outposts through the Ohio country, they could link their French forts in Canada with their Louisiana colony and keep the British bottled up on the East Coast. A memorandum by the Marquis de la Galicianaire, governor of New France, urges action. If the rapid progress of the English colonies be not arrested, they will possess, in a short time, formidable armaments on the continent of America. And if that happens, warns the Marquis, then all the other French colonies will fall to the British as well. Le Galassonier was a visionary. He saw that the struggle for North America had global implications. If the French lost, France would be weakened in Europe as well. For Britain, the stakes were just as high. If it allowed France to dominate the Ohio country, the British colonies could never expand westward. So British authorities send an expedition to order the French to withdraw from the Ohio country. The man they picked to lead it? None other than the 21-year-old Virginian, George Washington. Washington is a natural choice. Brimming with ambition, imposingly tall, he is well-connected and eager to make a name for himself. Washington draws his own map of the journey that will take him past the forks of the Ohio to Fort Labeouf near Lake Erie, a 500-mile journey that gets underway just as winter sets in. Along the route, Washington comes to a French base. The officer in charge gives a warm welcome to the young Virginian. But the French make it very clear they won't give in to his ultimatum. That night, he invited us to sup with them. Soon, the wine, which they dosed themselves with freely, loosened their tongues. With utmost charm, the officer lets him know the sentiment among the French in the region. They told us that it was their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio, and by God, they would do it. For, though the English could raise two men to their one, they knew our actions were too slow to prevent any undertaking of theirs. Brushed off by the French, 
Washington starts back to Virginia in December 1753. His report on the mission goes all the way to London, where King George II hears of the young Virginian who had done his best, but failed to persuade the French to leave the Ohio Valley. The following spring, the Virginians take up the Half King's offer to build a trading post at the forks of the Ohio. But it's not to be. Almost immediately, French troops forced the Virginians to surrender the forks and abandon their unfinished building. The Half King is furious. By taking the forks, the French have humiliated him, and the inability of the English to fight back makes him look like he's backed the losing side. He calculates how to get even. It's the young George Washington who unwittingly offers him that chance. That's how Washington came to ambush the French, his first taste of battle. That same spring of 1754, Washington is on his way back to the Forks with orders to help the Virginians finish their trading post. When he learns he is too late, he makes plans to confront the French and take the forks back. The half king agrees to be his ally. But Washington doesn't realize that the Indian leader has a complicated agenda of his own. If the half king orchestrates a confrontation between the British and the French, it will strengthen his own hand in the region. Why does the Half King go further and kill the wounded Frenchman? It's an act of revenge for his humiliation at the Forks, and a message to the French to back off. And he knows the blame will fall on George Washington, not himself. <laughs> You are not dead yet, my father, says the half king. An ironic twist to the respectful term the Indians usually use for their French allies. Washington's skirmish alone probably would not have triggered a larger war. But the cold-blooded murder of their wounded officer, the French couldn't possibly let that go without a response. Within weeks, the brother of the slain Ensign Jumonville sets off in pursuit. Washington has withdrawn his men to a large meadow. They build a crude stockade that the Virginians wryly name Fort Necessity. Washington expects the Half King to help defend the fort. But the Indian leader has lost confidence in the young major. This Washington. He is a good-natured man, but he has no experience. Always driving us to fight by his direction. And now he wants us to make a stand with him against the French. And that little thing upon the meadow. Washington's only Indian ally leaves. We have no choice. We will make our stand here. The French have no such problems with their native allies. They arrive accompanied by 100 Shawnee, Mingo, and Delaware warriors. 
About nine o'clock on the 3rd of July, the enemy advanced with shouts and dismal Indian yells. I'm alive! Washington intends to fight face to face in the field, European style. But the French and their Indian allies don't cooperate. They then, from every little rising tree, bush, stump, and stone, kept up a golden, constant fire, which we returned as best we could. Till late in the afternoon, when there fell the most tremendous rain that can be conceived. trenches with water and wet not only the ammunition and the firelocks but also the few stores that we had leaving us only a few bayonets for defense by nightfall the situation is hopeless When the French commander offers terms for surrender, Washington signs the soggy document. Unable to read French, he relies on a Dutch officer to translate. It turns out that Jumonville's brother is taking a sweet revenge. Washington doesn't learn until later that the document includes a confession to the assassination of Ensign Jumonville. The morning after the battle, the victorious French allowed Washington to retreat towards Virginia with his wounded and tattered troops. Word of his defeat spread quickly. This was not the kind of fame the young Washington had been seeking. The date, oddly enough, was the 4th of July, 1754. It's a logistical feat that only the British would attempt. Marching an army through 100 miles of dense forest, steep mountains, and muddy river crossings. After a week, they have gone only 22 miles. Frustrated by the slow progress, Braddock splits his force and takes an advance column of 1,400 men ahead. It is Washington's third adventure into the Ohio Valley. This time, he hopes to finally drive the French out. The main body of the army escapes any direct attacks. Others aren't always so lucky. English messenger James Smith is captured far from the column and taken to the French fort Duquesne. Move as fast as you can. <laughs> Running the gauntlet is customary for all Indian captives. Smith is turned over to the French. He'll wait to see whether the English will ever arrive at the fort. After three grueling weeks, the British Army finally approaches the Monongahela River, just a few miles south of Fort Duquesne. Morale is high. General Braddock has led his army nearly 100 miles. His engineers built log roads to cross the swamps. A company of sailors rigged block and tackle to hoist the heavy cannon over the hills. The worst is behind them. Once they reach the fort, nothing can stand in their way. 
It is my hope that this evening we will be drinking a toast at Fort Duquesne. Braddock has succeeded in transporting a modern army and its artillery deep into the wilderness. Washington is impressed. This is the kind of British officer the young Virginian aspires to be. Indian scouts working with the French keep a close watch on the approaching army. When word reaches Fort Duquesne of the advancing British column, the French realize their only hope is to ambush the British as they cross the Monongahela River. But their Indian allies balk, unwilling to take on the large enemy force. The French captain, Leonard de Beaujeu, dons Indian war dress and paints his face, a gesture of solidarity the British would never consider. the Indians agree to join the fight. At the front of the British column, George Croyne, a Pennsylvania trader, leads the seven remaining Indian scouts, moving quickly the last few miles toward Fort Duquesne. Captain Beaujeu's force of nearly 900 Indians, Canadians, and French regulars moves just as fast toward Braddock's column, still hoping to catch them at the river crossing. It's impossible to say who is more surprised when they encounter each other deep in the woods. Grenadiers move forward. Beaujeu leads the warriors and Canadians into the woods. He'll fight the battle the Indian way. In the beginning, it looks as if the highly disciplined British will prevail. Their volleys prove deadly immediately. Beaujeu is one of the first to fall. But once the Indians and Canadians slip into the hills on either side of the British, everything changes. Washington and the other officers struggle to keep their men in formation. The French regulars are deployed in front of the British column, blocking any forward movement. while the Indians and Canadians snipe at them from both sides. The British start to fall back, but on the narrow forest road, they collide with the troops behind them. Chaos ensues. Deadly tangles of redcoats massed together, making pathetically easy targets. The artillery proves useless in the dense woods. to fight. 
fight as the enemy does. We know the Indian mode. Certainly not, sir. Mind your place. It doesn't take long for the attackers to reach the rear of the British column. It is said that of the 54 women who marched with Braddock's army that day, only four returned. Some of the missing would turn up in Canada ransom from the Indians by the French. After three harrowing hours, it's over. The French and Indians have lost only 21 dead, while nearly a thousand British and provincial soldiers are killed or wounded. Washington has had several horses shot out from under him, but is unhurt. What's left of Braddock's army makes a desperate retreat. The shocking scenes which presented themselves in this night's march are not to be described. The dead, the dying, the wounded, the groans, the lamentation, the cries of the wounded for help along the road were enough to pierce a heart of adamant. The folly and consequence of opposing compact bodies against the manner of the Indians fighting in the woods, which had in a manner been predicted, were now so clearly verified. Word of the great Indian and French victory reaches Fort Duquesne by the end of the day. British prisoner James Smith reported the moment of the warrior's return. At sundown, I beheld a small party coming in with about a dozen prisoners. I stood on the fort wall until I beheld them begin to burn one of these men. They had him tied to a stake and kept touching him with firebrands. Smith is sure he'll meet the same fate. Instead, he will be adopted by an Indian family to replace kin who have died in battle. He will spend the next six years living among the Indians. French know they owe this victory to their native allies. The Indians gather the honors of battle to bring home evidence of their great feat. In European warfare, the victors might have pursued the fleeing British to crush them all together. But here in North America, the native peoples have different aims. They're not fighting to secure an empire. They're just trying to drive the invaders from their land. For now, anyway, the battle is over. Five days into the retreat, General Braddock dies of his wounds at an encampment near the Great Meadows. 
The brave but unfortunate General Braddock breathed his last. He was interred with the honor of war. And it was left to me to see that performed. He was deposited in the road over which the army, wagons and all, passed to hide every trace, lest the entombment be discovered. George Washington would admire Braddock's battlefield bravery for the rest of his life. The general's brass-barreled pistol and bloodied sash would hold a place of honor at Mount Vernon. For years after the Battle of the Monongahela, visitors here would come across the unburied bones of British and American soldiers. But empires don't come cheap. Both Britain and France would pay dearly in blood to win a prize as huge as North America. This was just the beginning. Neither side had any idea how costly this war would be or how many battles there were still to lose. North America, the outcome of this war should have been easy to predict. The British colonists outnumbered the French by 18 to 1. But what Britain didn't have was the one thing it needed most, the support of the Indian nations. It was the Indians who would determine the victory in North America. And until the British figured that out, they would never be able to turn the tide. of the war is unfolding in the Northeast. But there is another front, an almost forgotten one, on the Western frontier. That's where George Washington has been posted for two years. At age 25, he is commander of the Virginia Regiment, an undermanned force expected to defend the frontier from Indian raids. But his enemy is elusive. The campaign has been unsuccessful and frustrating. I am tired of this place, the inhabitants, and the life I lead here. So far, Washington can claim only one military engagement that wasn't a failure. A skirmish with the French that helped trigger this war. Since then, his two major battles have both ended badly. One when he surrendered to a larger French and Indian force. The other, the disastrous defeat of General Edward Braddock in 1755. Now Washington's military career is stalled, and his health precarious. My strongest representations relative to the peace of the frontier are disregarded as idle and frivolous. My orders, dark, doubtful, and uncertain. Today approved, tomorrow condemned. I am left to proceed at hazard accountable for the consequences and blamed without benefit of defense. <laughs> Worst of all, he feels he and his men are treated as inferiors by the British regular army. However, I am determined to bear up under all the embarrassments some time longer. 
To plead the case for his men and himself, Washington makes a visit to the new British commander for North America, John Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, an aristocratic Scotsman with little patience for colonials. Washington hopes to overcome the handicap of being born an American. He believes his service on the frontier has earned him an officer's commission in the regular British Army, not merely the provincial forces. Washington writes to the general in preparation for his visit. Although I have not the honor to be known to your lordship, yet your name was familiar to my ear on account of the important services performed to his majesty in other parts of the world. Do not think, my lord, that I mean to flatter. My nature is honest and free from guile. It doesn't work. Loudon keeps him waiting for several days, then finally grants him an audience. There's no record of what was said, but from all accounts, it didn't go the way Washington had hoped. Your Lordship, I trust you have had the opportunity to study my petition. Colonel Washington, I see no reason to alter the current provisions. The regiment performs a useful function on the frontier, and I shall require it to continue in that capacity. But, Your Lordship... You shall maintain your position at Winchester. It may be the lowest point in the young man's life. George Washington would never again seek a British commission. Chronically ill with dysentery and worried he has tuberculosis, now Loudon's ordered him to stay on the forgotten western frontier indefinitely. You will be all, Colonel. Thank you. In January 1758, Washington takes sick leave from the army and returns home to run Mount Vernon, the large estate he's inherited. Unlucky in war, he's also unlucky in love. The woman he wanted, a well-known beauty named Sally Fairfax, has married one of his best friends. It's not just the French soldiers who feel the effects of Montcalm's supply problems. Without gifts of muskets and powder, the French will lose the loyalty of their longtime Indian allies. Three years of war are already taking a terrible toll on Indian villages. Smallpox decimates whole settlements. Hunger has become a way of life. <coughs> Making peace with the English may be a matter of survival. But until the British can take Fort Duquesne at the forks of the Ohio, they'll never win the West. final assault on Fort Duquesne. For the first time in three years, British scouts can now see the fort and try to gauge the enemy's strength. In preparation for the assault, Forbes orders two parties of soldiers to chase down raiders who stubbornly continue to harass the British. George Washington leads one of the squads. The other is commanded by his close friend, Colonel George Mercer. The two groups come across each other in heavy fog. and 
Keep firing! It's Mercer! Hold your fire! Hold your firemen! It's Mercer! When the fog clears for a moment, Washington realizes the terrible mistake. throws himself between the two lines, indifferent to the musket balls flying past his head. When the friendly fire skirmish was over, two officers and 38 men were dead or wounded. Incredibly, George Washington was unhurt this was only his fourth major military action and not one he could take any pride in. But no one could question his remarkable bravery or his luck. Years later, he recalled that this was the most dangerous moment of his life and speculated that perhaps uh, Providence might have spared him for some other purpose. Just two weeks later, on November 23rd, 1758, Forbes' army is finally ready to make its assault on Fort Duquesne. But rather than fight a battle they know they will lose, the outnumbered French destroy the fort and withdraw to Canada. Without firing a shot, General Forbes has won the prize. He renames the spot Pittsburgh for the Prime Minister who made victory possible. A few months later, he is dead. For five years, George Washington has been working toward this goal, wresting the forks of the Ohio away from the French. He stays only long enough to perform one sad duty. Returning to the battlefield where General Braddock and hundreds of troops were killed three years earlier, Washington's men bury the remains with overdue military honors. Since this war began, Washington has suffered painful illness and survived several brushes with death. He has made some serious blunders and been part of Britain's worst defeat in North America. But he is coming away with valuable experience forged in the fire of battle. And the lessons he's learned will not be forgotten. At age 27, he decides it's time to let others finish the war. He returns to Mount Vernon. There he will embark on two new chapters in his life. One is political. He has recently won a seat in the Virginia House of Burgesses. The other, personal. He's going home to marry Martha Custis, the wealthiest widow in Virginia. War seldom brings happy endings. But for George Washington, this one came close. On his retirement from the army, he had won the respect of the men who had served under him. Perhaps more important, the French and Indian War is finally over. Voltaire would later quip that in surrendering Canada, France had lost only a few acres of snow. It is, of course, much more. Britain's holdings are suddenly transformed into a continental empire of nearly a half billion acres. The territory holds vast potential. But as the British will discover, the fruits of imperial victory can also carry the seeds of an empire's disintegration.
To the young man who'd been at the center of the war, the news from Canada should have been more exciting. But George Washington is a civilian again. Each morning, Washington rides out to oversee activity on his estate, made larger through his marriage to the wealthy widow, Martha Custis. I am now, I believe, fixed at this seat with an agreeable consort for life and hope to find more happiness in retirement than I ever experienced amidst a wide and bustling world. Washington has also been elected to Virginia's assembly, the House of Burgesses. He sits on the Committee of Propositions and Grievances. It's an exciting time to enter politics in America. The reason it's exciting is the King's Prime Minister, William Pitt. He had encouraged the colonists to think of themselves as active partners with the Crown in a great imperial enterprise. We asked that you consider that next year... Colonists willingly put up money and manpower for the war. In return, they assumed Parliament recognized it was their right to levy taxes through their elected representatives. It's a misunderstanding that would eventually lead to revolution. Bonjour, Louis Nishnah, Vandoc. Brethren, the English have treated us with much disrespect. In 1763, an Ottawa war chief named Pontiac uses powerful religious ideas to stir his fellow Indians to action. The master of life took Nowland by the hand and gave him a fancy hat. Pontiac tells them of the visions of a Delaware Indian prophet named Nowland and his encounter with their creator, the master of life. The master of life spoke to him. This land that I created was for you and no one else. As for those who came to trouble your lands, Nowlin said, drive them out, make war upon them. War belts spread Pontiac's message. Indians who once played the two European empires against each other now band together against the British. This would be a new war. On the morning of June 2nd, 1763, warriors from the Ojibwe and Sauk nations are engaged in a heated game of Bagatoué, or as the French call it, lacrosse. The game is entering its third day outside Fort Michilmackinac on the northernmost reaches of modern-day Michigan. We know of the game that day from the writings of one of the first English traders to venture into the territories, Alexander Henry. I did not go to see the match which was to be played outside the fort, but rather employed myself in writing letters. The British had no idea why this game of lacrosse was really being played here. They didn't realize that Amherst's reforms had insulted and enraged the native people. And they had not yet heard a very important piece of news. Only the Indians knew that a month earlier, Pontiac had inspired an Indian attack on Fort Detroit. Make war upon them. It was a sign of things to come. And now it comes to Michel Mackinac.
Going instantly to my window, I saw a group of Indians within the fort. They were furiously cutting down and scalping every Englishman they found. The dying were writhing and shrieking under the knife and tomahawk. I was shaken, not only with horror but with fear. I found many of the French Canadian inhabitants calmly looking on. The attack at Michilimackinac would be repeated as one British outpost after another falls to the Indians, and this new war spreads across the land. Under Amherst's command, the British managed to lose all but three of their major forts in the backcountry to Indians inspired by Pontiac. Hundreds of soldiers and thousands of civilians are killed or taken captive. February 1763, Britain and France signed the Treaty of Paris, ending at last the Seven Years' War. King George III now rules more territory across the globe than was ever held by the Roman Empire. But the territory in North America is now so vast, the British must find a new way to manage it the king issues the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Among its provisions is a new boundary. The proclamation goes even further than the Treaty of Easton, asserting that all lands west of the Appalachians, the heart of the continent, are reserved for the Indians. And yet, more immigrants than ever are settling in the back country. In the 1760s, the Ohio country plays host to a new migration from Britain and other parts of Europe. Newcomers cut their way into North America's interior, often marking the corners of their land claims with their initials. The migration was fueled by letters from friends and relatives who had served with British forces during the French and Indian War. Colonials had been fighting for access to the continent's vast interior. After all, that's what they thought the war was all about. And now the king has declared the very land they are settling is off limits, reserved for Indians. And there was another source of tension, money. The war had doubled Britain's national debt. British taxpayers had long shouldered the burden. Now Parliament expected American colonists to pay their share. A small tax on paper, the Stamp Act, causes an unexpectedly violent reaction in the colonies. Riots break out. Tax officials are burned in effigy and forced from their jobs. The tax is widely ignored. Why is the reaction so incendiary? The root of colonial frustrations can be traced to the French and Indian War. A year later, Washington is preparing ragtag continental troops for battle. It is 21 years to the day since Washington witnessed General Braddock's stunning defeat. 
in the first major battle of the French and Indian War. I did not let the anniversary of the ninth of this month pass without a grateful remembrance of the escape we had on the banks of the Monongahela. It is the same providence that spared him that horrendous day, Washington hopes, which will see them through the battle to come. So like Washington, many of these soldiers are veterans of another war, a war fought fervently on behalf of their empire, not against it. How unexpected, how ironic, Britain won the war for America, but in doing so, it unleashed passions that will lead it to lose America. Gentlemen, a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having indirect the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction. And there's all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That same month, at the forks of the Ohio, the heart of events for the past 23 years, colonial representatives meet with Gayasuta. He tries to assert Indian dominion over the land. We will not suffer either the English or American to march an army through our country. I am appointed by the Six Nations to take care of this country. And I will. And he tries. To maintain the independence of his people, Gayasuda needs a powerful ally. But the French are gone forever, and the British would abandon the Indians to their fate. Under President Washington, Americans forced the Indians off the lands that Gayasuda vowed to defend. In 1754, no one in America imagined that a backwoods territorial dispute would end up transforming the world. But the French and Indian War did just that. By eliminating France's empire in North America, by allowing British leaders to believe they could exercise power without restraint, by convincing colonists they had no choice but to resist that power, even to the point of revolution, and by depriving Indian people of the allies needed to help protect their land and their autonomy. No one expected any of this to happen, but by changing the face of the continent, the French and Indian War became the war that made America. <laughs> 